Welcome to the party. I'm not here right now, but I want you to listen very carefully. These guys are very funny, so pay attention. Enough talk. It's showtime. Hello and welcome to Bags of Action. My name's Steve, my co-host is Pete. Hello. This episode we are talking about The Running Man. This is about the only Arnie film we haven't talked about from 1987. The same year as Predator. Made them both in the same year. Okay, I thought we covered pretty much all of the really big Arnie films and yet somehow we missed this one. We've missed this one and we haven't done... Uh, the Conan films, and I think that's more or less oh, yeah. it. True, bar the comedies. Yeah, we don't. We can't really squeeze them in. Well, so, Kindergarten yeah. Cop, I'd say, is on the line. But... <laughs> the next one does have Dolph Lundgren in, doesn't it? The second one. It, it does in the in the straight to. Uh, I don't even say you can't really say straight to video anymore. Uh, straight to video about, on demand from a couple of years ago. Yeah, it is. Um, it's been a like hard target too. Is Scott Adkins and uh, Kindergarten Cop too? Didn't Vin one, Diesel do one? Or did he do something like that? No, he did the Pacifier, I believe. That was it. I knew it was something similar with kids and yeah. and you know. And The Rock did the Tooth Fairy. That was it. There's, yeah. There's a whole. And what did Hulk Hogan do? There was one he did as well. There's a whole subgenre of action heroes with small kids. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And anyway. a cop and a half with Burt Reynolds, which I don't watch that. Even I didn't like that. And I like everything. <laughs> it's true. You do like everything. Yeah, like, so I said, good in, I said the good in all things, all people and all movies. <laughs> oh, you've changed. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, as you said, the same year as Predator. Um, I'm trying to remember the first time I saw it. I didn't see this at the cinema. I must have seen it on video, for those who are old enough to remember video, the first time. Um, so I would have been about 15, 16 or something. What about I think you? I was a dis, not dissimilar age, but I actually, this was one of, I'm going to say it really quietly in case Rupert Murdoch comes around my house. Uh, this was one of the ones where I think my sister's boyfriend at the time used to f- used to tape films off Sky for me. Right, right. right yeah. And then I'll take the tab, if, li- if I didn't like it, I'd record over it. If I liked it, I'd take the tabs off. Uh, I'll take the tabs off so I could keep it. And this is one I kept. This and I think uh, Nightmare on Elm Street three were two of the ones that I uh, I kept. So I watched this quite a lot because I lived in the country. My mum didn't drive, so if I didn't, if I wanted to watch a film and my dad wasn't in, I had no way of getting one. So I'd be like, "What have I bought? What have I t- had taped off Sky? Oh, I'll watch that again." So, so I would, you know. Should we talk about some of, the, quite a lot. some of the the cast and the crew because mm. there's a lot of interesting people in this one so obviously there's Arnie but we should also mention uh, the great late great unfortunately Yafet Koto who passed yep. away very recently only a few months ago um, and of course we know him all the way back from a midnight uh, run which we talked about from Alien from back in yep. the day um, he's done he's done a lot of films uh, he was in um, is it Dr. No yeah, James Bond, Bond films, film. yeah, yeah. Um, I remember him from that um, so he's done a lot of great things but yes he's he's in this uh, Jesse Ventura, Jesse the Body Ventura, don't forget. Indeed. Um, also in Predator. So he was in the same two films yeah, in the same year. That's really interesting that the two big Arnie films that I, I would I would argue that probably Predator is, uh, well, one, it's the better film, but two, it's probably the bigger hit. I'd have to check the, yeah, the box. Although I, I know this because I'm currently listening to Arnie's autobiography, uh, oh, right. Total Recall, and I'm halfway through yeah. the 24-hour... 30 chapter book uh <laughs> and he tried to get double his money film to film and he got three million dollars for predator and five million dollars for the running man wow because he was at the first stages of kind of being a box office cert having only got 250 grand i think for conan wow of, he just was doubling his money pretty much every film okay as he made, as he made a name for himself uh, but he also had a bit of a his thing was kind of bringing in people he'd worked with before to yes. movies. Yes. So 
your friend of mine, Sven Oli Thorson, is in this, who we met on Conan. Yes. Um, and Franco Colombo, who is his best friend, friend. training partner, mm. uh, best man. He's in nearly all of his films. Yeah. Uh, and, or was, sorry, he's also passed, passed away. away very, too, but he yeah. also was name-checked as the fake director of the Jack Slater movies in Last Action Hero. Wow, okay. Um, Franco Colombo. So he's in this as well. And then again, yeah, met Jesse Ventura on Predator. And, um, and it also seems like even when Arnie wasn't producing, he had quite a he forceful personality, very confident man. Yep. So he seemed to have quite a lot of say on like who else would be cast in 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 the films. Mm. So he may well have, you know, brought these people in with him. There's also some musicians in this film who are just strange. Mick Fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac is the um the tech guy with the beard. Right. <laughs> Um, and one of his one of his other people is Dweezil Zappa, who is Frank Zappa's son, who's also a musician. Okay, right. A lot of the underground people, I think, in this are musicians. Yeah. And you've got Jim Brown is in it. Okay. Um, Maria Conchita Alonso, who as well she's been in Predator Two, I think she's in. Uh, um, I think so. Yeah, and Kurt Fuller, just lots of very familiar, and Richard Dawson as Killian. Of course, um, yeah. Essentially playing Simon Cowell before Simon Cowell was created. Well, that, there's something actually I want to talk about that will come back to that as well, to do with kind of reality TV and stuff. That's kind of the core yeah. of this. But we should talk about the writer, a very, very, very familiar name, uh, Stephen D'Souza, who yes. has worked on, I would argue, as the writer, the main writer at least, or the main credited writer, as some of the best action movies from the 80s and 90s. So he's done. he did loads of TV, and then he did things like... Die Hard. Die Hard, a Jumping Jack Flash, Commando, he worked on that, uh, 48 Hours, um, what else? He's done He's done loads and loads, loads and loads stuff. of films. And, of course, he was adapting a Richard Bachman novel, but Richard Bachman, of course, is Stephen King. So Stephen King's story, this was... But back then, nobody knew no. that it was King. No. Um, but they started adapting a bunch of his stuff, and then it kind of came out, I think. And the director... Mm-hmm. He's not who was supposed to direct. Again, I found this out from listening to the autobiography. Okay, go on. I deliberately today listened to quite a lot so I could catch up to the when this was made. Yeah. So I, I came to this. I've done my homework, Steve, mm-hmm. uh, for once. Um, so this was directed by Paul Michael Glazier, who people will know as Starsky from Starsky and Hutch. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, he'd been directing episodes of Starsky and Hutch. A bit like lots of people do, like Riker, like Jonathan Frakes. Lots of people tend yep. to when they get to a certain point along in the series, they'll, if they want to direct, that's their kind of first step. And he directed mostly TV. But what I didn't realise, so Arnie got married in the same year he was doing Predator. He left the Predator set to have his wedding and came went back to the set. <laughs> um, and apparently Jesse Ventura was in the woods all the way through scenes after he died in the film. Spoiler. Right. Um, every time Arnie had a line, he'd be whispering, I do, I do, and putting them off and making them corpse, uh, <laughs> apparently. But so this was around a, a similar time, but Arnie went off to do some promotional work. I can't think it was a predator for something else, but he went off for a week, mm-hmm. a one week into shooting, and they came back and they'd sacked the original director. So Andrew Davis, who went on to do Above the Law, Under Siege, and The Fugitive, was the original director. And then Arnie went away, came back, and they went, oh, we didn't like him. Here's Starsky. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So that was a bit of a that's a surprise. Bit of a shock, and he said he felt he was a bit because again, listening to Arnie, he's very calculated. I want to work with this director because that will everything he does is to get to the next step. The only things that probably don't do that, like Red Sonia and Raw Deal, were kind of contractual things he had to do from his. He had a deal on the producer for Conan. Yeah. That kind of he was tied in for ten years to only work with that producer. Then he got a new agent. You kind of managed to negotiate him out. And they're like, well, be, be in this film. It's on you. Okay, do another action movie for me and put me in Raw Deal. Um, but the project that Arnie really wanted to do with that producer was Total Recall. But Total Recall was cast by with two different actors before Arnie. First, it was going to be shot in Australia with Richard Dreyfus. Right. And then it was going to be shot, I think it was in Rome, with Patrick Swayze. But both times they ran out of money and then actually Arnie was the one who went to another production company and bought the rights off this guy yeah, and then got it made. Arnie was at the driving force in Total Recall being made because he liked the story so much. And wow. The so much. So, Fascinating. Sorry. Slightly not running man related, but it's around yeah. the same time. So, 
Right. Yeah, he's as we know, he's a very clever guy. When when you did your interview with uh, Michael Rooker, Einstein. Uh, uh, sorry, Michael Einstein. Sorry, I was thinking about Rooker today. Uh, Michael Einstein. He spoke about how uh, Arnie. A lot of people underestimate Arnie. Um, and then you know he he asked him for advice when he was working on Total Recall and yeah um, yeah, it's yeah you listen to all that you, yeah listen to all this is all about you know he did, took the same kind of drive ambition and confidence into bodybuilding then he mm. took it into his own businesses didn't realize he was like buying and selling buildings and then running real estate um, yeah, yeah a lot of real estate running bodybuilding events he'd already made a million before he ever got a part in the film and before mm. he was ever part of the Kennedy family and stuff. So it's kind of a, very much a self-made yeah. man, but no, it's very fascinating, fascinating mm. book. So um, I've not, I've not read the book that this is based on the running man. I've, I've read a lot of Stephen King, but this is one, one that I've just never got around to for. I think it's like a novella, reason. I think from memory. I think so. I don't think it's a very long book, no. um, but it's, I think he released it under Backman's name one, because I didn't want it to know it was him. And at that point you couldn't really diversify very easily and yeah. do other things without having a pen name. So for, there was about half a dozen Backman books that came out before people twigged and it was leaked that it was him. Um, but yes, yeah, I might go back and read it. Apparently it's quite different in places. I think the core idea is the same, but obviously they've turned it up to 11 and then they put Arnie in it. And they've Arnie did, they've yeah. Arnie did because yeah. they just I didn't again another thing that he said in, the, in his book is that they brought in different writers to write the one liners to make films more Arnie. Right. But, I mean, in you think like oh when people say, Well, I'll be back because it's from Terminator. And I go, Oh no, it's from this film. Oh no, it's from this film. That's because he says it in all his films. Because Terminator is the first time he said it. Right. Um and then it became so he says it in this. He says it really? in this. He says to um Gotten. when he's put into the pod to be sent off to the game, he turns to, to Killian. Go, he turns to Killian and says, yes. I'll be back. And I'm like, hang on a second. And it's like he just, you know, so he just decided, I'm sorry, James Cameron, do you mind if I just take that line? Just say it in every, <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, every single chopper. Time. At least he doesn't say that in this one. No, that's true. It really make, it make very no, it make yeah. very little sense. <laughs> I'm sure he could find a way. That, I'm sure he could. To get it. And of course, this film was set in the future, in the vast distant future of yep. 2017. Yes. Wow. What yeah. a future it was. Yeah. Well, they got quite a lot of it right. <laughs> <laughs> so, some, yes. We don't yeah. quite have the exploding head collars, although I kind of wish we did at times. It would be very handy. It would have been really handy in the last 18 months. <laughs> Not wearing a mask. <laughs> you want the vaccine? No. Oh. Off you go. <laughs> Just run out past that line. Why? Yeah. No reason. Off you go. See what happens. Freedom! Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah. anyway, so I don't think I've seen this one very often. I think the first time I saw it was on TV, and it was like the dubbed cut version. And then the next time I saw it was the full version with, you know, a bit more violence that it left in and no more mother truckers and other things like that although he didn't he didn't say mother trucker in this one but uh, yes they kind of uh, taken things out for television as they did quite often back then so it'd be a saturday night film and it turned a one and a half hour film into like three hours or something but uh, did you see as you said you saw it have you seen it fairly really recently apart from you know for this no i think i watched it on a loop for years and then just didn't didn't watch it for ages it's, right it's, I remembered an awful lot about it. I remembered a lot of lines and bits. It's a lot taller than I remember because it's only right. an hour and 35. And I think by modern standards, mm. because they drop you straight into an action sequence in the helicopter. Yep. Then they jump you forward 18 months and they don't spend time going, well, they met each other this way. This is how they get to know him. Even though he's a cop, they do kind of trust him, but they don't. But they need each other to get out of the prison. They don't do any of that nonsense. No, no exposition no. at all. It's just like they're breaking out together, and you and they quite well, I think, give you little bits of information by how they interact with each other. And you go, mm. "Wow, you've just covered eighteen months in like in two scenes." That's it's and really it is good. Pretty relentless action wise. You just yeah. kind of like, "Whoa, okay." No one's really sitting and chatting in this movie. Uh, no, uh, they're account. running and punching and chatting at the same time. Yes. Yes, I, I, it's jumping ahead, but you know he fights various people as he as he was bound to, and I like the way they kind of match some of the stuff in the films to the characters, but also to the actors. Yeah, that that kind of really fits really well. Um, 
and, and he, you know, because it's an Arnie film, you know he's always going to survive. You know he's always going to get through it. That's not the that's not the point of it. The point is just trying to see is to go on the adventure with them, and and, and you know, we're into this weird world of reality TV. Um, you know what it it reminded me of watching this again and thinking about you know modern reality, but it also made me think of like RoboCop. Yeah. Uh, the TV's degenerated and this thing, you know, I'll buy that for a dollar and I'll, you know, and do this and do that. And society's kind of crumbled to the point where entertainment could be anything. And you think, oh, this would never happen. And then I started thinking about it and thought, okay, think about shows we've got that are similar now. There's The Hunted, where you don't yeah. kill the person, but you have to, and then there's, is that the one where you have to stay completely free? You can't sit still and you have to, you have like seven days to evade the best hunter's in the police and the army. Yeah, and I think so. I think that's what it's called. Intelligence is that one. There's another one where, you know, you have to do certain things for money. There's people watching people watching telly in, in goggle box. There's all the reality TV of ordinary well, people being dropped into weird situations. This is not that, you know, the show is not dissimilar to American Gladiators, I found. Yeah, you yeah. Know, back in so, the day, I remember like early 90s, and before the British Gladiators, which was quite watered down, the American yep. Gladiators show was actually, it wasn't the same as this because no one had a chainsaw. But in terms of like members of the public versus not stalkers, gladiators, but mm-hmm. with a name and a persona and stuff, it wasn't yep. dissimilar territory. Um, but it's even like there's a bit in one of the ads where people are climbing up a rope while Doberman pinches are attacking them for money. And there has been a show, I think it's called Run from the Dogs, when it was on ITV3 or something, where celebrities would have to try and run away by being chased by dogs in the woods. Well, that is a real thing that exists. Yeah. Well, and you just go, well, people do awful things for money. Like, I know it's a terrible show because I can't, I can't stand it, but that I'm a celebrity thing. But they have all these awful challenges, like crawl through this box of spiders to get a thing and then you can get food. And you're like, Hang on. If you take a step back and you think about you're forcing a person to earn their food by crawling through something that potentially it's not really dangerous, but it's quite uncomfortable. No. But if they were actually poisonous spiders and I just told them that they were poisonous spiders and snakes and that one bite could kill them, then it becomes very close to the running man. And that made me really uncomfortable. Cause I thought and the other thing as well is like that in this, there's kind of, there's all about it's an element of about celebrity because yeah. even a killer can have a certain amount of notoriety. And yeah, and they're all famous. cheering for him yeah, and like yeah. and they cheer for the killers. They're not they don't cheer for the for the people. Absolutely. It's and not until that old woman cheers for him. Yeah. And then wants to bet on him. It's like, no, 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 he's one of the things he's love. And she's like, well, I want to burn him. And they go, Yeah, all right, yeah, I'll put some on you. And then they start dealing and you go, Yeah, okay, all right. Because we used to cheer, like on gladiators, you said you'd cheer for the contestants until you get one that you like and then they flip it and then you have both sides. I suppose the clever thing here, I guess, is all linked to the judiciary system. But I, there's some subtle little things in this that there's things like get me the president's agent on the phone or, or publicist. Yeah. And they're, and they're, oh, and they're talking to the judiciary about ratings. The ratings get high. The money gets put into the judiciary. They then have a way of dealing with criminals. Yeah. And it makes the world very binary, which again is much like today where, the, oh, well, He's been to prison. He's bad. They're the police. They're good. It's kind of very old, yep. kind of very simplistic thinking. And it's almost like keep the people oppressed by giving them a very simple... Entertained. The, yeah, entertained, exactly. Exactly. Keep and them it's, entertained, keep them distracted, keep yeah. them happy, and then they're not paying attention to what's actually going on. That's how politicians do it. Yeah. And there's, I mean, other Demolition Man touches on some similar themes. Yeah, yeah. Um, like you said, Robocop, I think, well, anything with Verhoeven, really. Um, yeah, yeah. So Total Recall does as well. It's kind of... Oh, yeah, definitely, yeah, it yeah. It's those kind of um, things. But in some ways, this is a very prototypical Arnie film. He's the, you know, he walks in. You see him on the... as Well, they do the save the cat thing of, like, this is a good person. He doesn't want to kill these innocent people. But, oh, they're going to... They've, they've framed him, so you... You've got empathy for him straight away. Yeah. But then he's got the full, he's very like um larger than life, the beard and the scar, his world gym t-shirt, which again comes from his kind of bodybuilding world that he's brought in to mm-hmm. bring the t-shirt model zone. Yeah. Um and then you then he's very violent towards a woman, and you just kind of like, oh actually he's a bit and he, I think Arnie used to tread that line in his film sometimes like he's a he's really charming, but not 
uh, to an element not that nice, but then mm. you grow to kind of like the character. And I think yeah. it's kind yeah. of it's a bit like that here because at first, and I think that's deliberate. He's supposed to be, yeah, he's not a you know child murderer. No. He's not the butcher of Bakersfield. No. Uh, which I did remember. I remember that. I also remember the name of the three people that were supposed to have won it before, Whitman, Price, and Adil. I remember that from when <laughs> nice. I was a teenager. Nice. Um, or a dad, sorry. Um, but he's not, a, but he is, but it's clever. It's like he is part of this regime, but mm-hmm. he's not as bad as he could be. And it, there's, I don't want to say this too much with Arnie, but there's like a parallel with like people who were kind of in the war that were like, well, they were just doing their job. They didn't, you know what I mean? It's kind yeah. of, it wasn't also, what they believed in. That idea of, you know, um, we can, so w- the moment we've got that thing, what's the thing where they change someone's face and it makes a celebrity look like someone's Oh, called? deep fakes. Yeah. So there's that kind of thing to an nth degree in the film it's a yes. case of the winners are fine they're living on the island and it's you know it's cgi of the era so it's fine but now if you were doing it and we've had this like in black mirror you've had it in um charlie brooker did a thing as well showing about how reality tv can be altered to make something appear like he filmed something that they'd set up with a number of cameras of a sort of big brother type thing and then he recut it and showed you it to make it tell a different story. And in yeah. this, this is what they do. You know, the three people who won the have won, three runners, they're fine, they're living this great life, all the rest of it. And then they kind of, you know, recut the footage to show that he died and that, you know, Jesse killed him. And you're like, okay, now it's just TV's creating its own narrative and telling the story that makes the one that they want, that makes the Well, it's clever. Want. When they when they wanted, you know, they obviously needed um Ben Richards to lose. Yeah. So they did. They got a stunt double. A little bit of an entry term for me working in VFX. Get a traveling mat. I'm like, oh, that's a proper term. I wonder if that was uh, they got as the big body double. I wonder. Might have been. Because he's might as big been. as Jesse and it could have been him. That's true. And there's a lovely bait and switch with, with, with his character in this. Mm-hmm. That's really clever. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's yeah. Very. Like- you know, Go on. CGI. But yeah, no, it's just CGI. the fact they do this thing of like, you know, and that, that wraps the story up for the public. Yeah. And that's that. But it's interesting how we always talk about this a lot about technology aging. So in 1987, their vision of 2017 had very simplistic graphics on their computers and, and no real color to it. Yep. Also, I was like, I don't think you'd be keeping the original raw footage on a disc in a filing cabinet. <laughs> That'll be in the cloud uh, if or nowhere. Because you don't need it. Once you've made the the duped copy, you don't need the true one that's going to let him off. But um, there's a few little contrivances. Yep. Um, yep. But it was a film made in 1987, you know. Yeah. They, yeah. they couldn't actually see into the future. And we are sat here now in, you know, quite a few years after this was set. Uh, that's the scary thing, yes. We're now that far ahead of it. I mean, some of the one-liners I had remembered, as you said, you know, like, I'll be back. And the uh, here... Sub zero now. What is it? Less than plain zero. zero plain like, zero. I just, yeah. I was just like, oh, this, this. Some of them are as painful. Some of them I have think, become iconic, and some of them are just bad. You know. Yeah, I think that's the thing of hearing him say today, "What a pain!" And he says, "What a pain in the neck to the guy who's, who's like to um yeah, buzz saw." Yeah. The fact that there was like a oh to make it, and he he said one of the reasons he wanted to do that was because he wanted his characters to be a bit different from Sly's, to be a bit larger than life and a bit more comedic because he thought he thought you build the tension to a to a violent scene, and then you make a one liner just to try and bring the audience back down a little bit. Mm. But I I thought this film was ridiculously violent as a teenager, and I was actually a little bit frightened of it. And I watched it now, and it's like, eh. Huh? It's pretty tame. But I think it was just, <laughs> I think as a 15-year-old brought up in the country, like, he's got a chainsaw. Don't have a chainsaw. He hasn't even got a guard, he's got a guard on his chainsaw. What's nope. he doing? Where's he's riding his a motorbike. His helmet, his yeah, exactly. That's just not health and safety gone, gone <laughs> mad. Um, there's no risk assessment for this. No. Nope. So, but I think as a kid, I was like, because it was like, you know, it's an ice hockey stick with a blade on the end, and it's uh, and they were like very larger than life characters. It seemed like it was super, super violent and really bloody. And I watched yep. it again. And I was like, no, not especially. Um, it's more of it. What's in your head? I think. Yeah, it? I think you're right. And at that age, just you know, very different to the old cynical person mm. I am now. But uh, as you said, Richard Dawson playing Killian as this awful spokesman and the face of the game and the host and the compare who's supposed to, you know. But I think the thing at the time, it was like, well, the presenters shouldn't be that big 
a thing. They shouldn't be coming in, everyone clapping and high fiving them. That's weird. It's the contestants. And then as time's gone on, well, it's oh, very the, ju- like... the, the judges are more important than the people taking part. And yeah, and literally, literally Simon Cowell on the X Factor and Britain's Got Talent and stuff walks out and high fives people, walks through the crowd. It's very, very, very similar to this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think also in in America and in this country later, we had certain names associated with certain games. So in America, it would be like Jeopardy was so and so for forty years, or yeah. Uh, the price is right with someone else for 30 years. And it's just that person that is always there and they become like a, a staple. You know that at this time, at this day, this person's doing this show and that's the guy presenting it. And 99.9%, it's a guy as well. Yes. As the, other thing. It's the, Until- the price is right guy, if I remember rightly, is the one who has a fight with Happy Gilmore at the Celebrity Alec- Golf is Alex in- Tre- No, Alex Trebek did, did Jeopardy. I know that. of R. Burton, isn't it? Or temporarily. Uh, well, I think Alex Tre- Alex Trebek, I think he passed away or he retired, but I know that he's not doing it anymore. Um, But it was him. It was always him. And even though we don't have that jeopardy in this country, I'm aware of it just through, you know, pop culture. And it's that kind of thing that Killian, Killian, you know, and they're all cheering for him. And he's He's, he's, he's basically, for the British audience, he's basically Bruce Forsyth. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, he is. Uh, It's just this kind of thing. Anyway, do you want to talk about some of the... uh, the people that they asked to fight. We mentioned Buzzsaw and, and Sub Zero. Sub Zero and Dynamo. Yeah, they're all a bit rubbish until you really get to Jesse. They, watching it now, they are. I, I've been thinking of oh, Buzzsaw, this big kind of guy. He's got a chainsaw. He's on a motorbike. That's pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And you go, well, he can't really stay up on his bike very well. And he kind of <laughs> takes them out quite easily. They do have a little bit of a tussle, yeah. but it's not. It's quite... Um, Tame. Tame, really. <laughs> oh, and Sub-Zero, I remember thinking he was super cool. Just like, he just comes out and he just kind of puts the the teacher guy in, into the goal. Yeah. And then just yeah, he's taken out relatively easily as well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that thing of Jesse, I love it when he uh, called Captain Freedom. Yes. Where they, it's that thing of they dress him up in that awful suit and he's like, I don't need all this shit and just rips it off. And I, that felt very much like that was just Jesse talking. Like it, it just, it wasn't the character. It just got so close to the knuckle, I thought. Yeah. That that felt almost like they tried to do something like that. And they said, oh no, we can use this. We can use this somehow. It, it just, you know, it seemed to fit with him so well. You think who else could have done that and become that kind of like arrogant and, you should eat some of this, make your sexual Tyrannosaurus. You know, it's that kind of, wow, who would say that can get away with it other than him? I can't really think of anyone. <laughs> and I like the bit where he is asked to do the gimmicks and he refuses and then Killian's like, what's the matter with you? Steroids make you deaf? I told you to do something, boy. And it's very... And I like that, again, knowing like Arnie's bodybuilding background and these, a lot of these people are from the same kind of world and he's kind yep. of, and he doesn't like being taken, you know, he's like, actually I'm, I speak lots of languages. I'm a businessman. I'm not mm-hmm. the knucklehead you think I am. Yeah. I just think some of those, they also feel like things that maybe someone on the set went, Oh, you should say something about it, steroids. It just feels like something that might've come out of the, the, the casting really. Or part of the thing, once they know that it was Arnie in the lead, you know, he was going to be the one they could bring in certain things. Like D'Souza is a smart writer. He knows what he's doing. He writes to people's strengths. You know, he writes to the character that's has some elements of the actor, whether it's in 48 hours or die hard, or, you know, he pulls things out and it just, it fits. Somehow he's able to get the voice right for the actor. It's really good. And uh, the thing is in a way, this is a bit, is similar to Predator that they haven't done. I think what happens a lot with Arnie is going, he's the big guy compared to other people around him. So whether it's like Red Heat or whatever, they're leaning into that difference. Yes. But then in other ones, they go, well, he's in a team, but they can't, okay, we have to get some very big people. We have to get Carl Weathers, Bill Duke, you know, um, Mm -hmm. Jesse Ventura. And then he, it's funny, we're going to have to get people of his similar size to make it look like they're his kind of, equivalence really yeah whereas in real life that like that you'd be like well, where all these big people come from <laughs> it'd be very odd very strange not in not i guess in the futuristic world of 2017 but um no. yeah. yeah maybe not but today you know yeah it's a lot easier today to find some very large men that to be is actors true. whether it's you know 
uh, Martin Ford in films or TV, uh, you know, really large men, or there's the Danish giant who's now like the next, you know, giant yeah. guy. Um, I'm currently watching The Nevers with uh, Martin Ford. And so I'm mm-hmm. turning up in that. And I was like, ah! <laughs> so that was like, really, he's so big and so indistinct. There again, you, you recognize him straight away. And that's the same kind of thing with Arnie back then. There wasn't anybody who looked like Arnie who was a lead actor. There, there just wasn't. I mean, you had Stallone, but he's not the same. Stallone, no, it's not. Stallone built American. up to that. After Rocky, Stallone built up to that anyway. Yeah. In terms of, but no, this was going the other direction, really. Got, I didn't realise, again, from is that he'd won a Golden Globe for best debut performance in like in um, Stay Hungry in really early days. And he was wow. taking acting classes and like later he took like comedy classes. And you think I'd always been like, oh, he was a big bloke. They stuck him in some films and sort and sort of saw what happened. But it, he actually did work at the craft mm. and went to America with the intention of becoming an actor. Yep. But doing bodybuilding first, it wasn't just, oh, he wasn't just like, it was not like Jason Statham being like a French connection model or whatever he was and a yeah, yeah. dancer in a shaman video. And they went, oh, you look like you could look good in a movie. Um <laughs> It was actually, well, actually, I'm trying to be an actor. And he did actually put, you know. He's he's always had a plan in. and he's just worked through it step by step by step and he's achieved everything he's wanted to do. And then he wanted to do, you know, government and he became the governor and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And he's just, the only thing that's held him back is that because he's not a Native American born, he could never become president. So he never went to become a senator or president, you know. I, I suspect if he'd done it, he would have. If he'd been able to, he would have. I done think it. he could have been the president. Yeah. Oh, easy. But they, yeah, the rules are the rules there, so they haven't changed them. So only when it would work is in demolition man. That's the only time it's been allowed. <laughs> it's the Schwarzenegger <laughs> law, I believe, it's called. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah. But yeah, there was no one like him at this time. Yeah, it's it's very different now. But back then. We talk about this, I think we talk about this not, not very much, but action movies now, there's there's 100 of them every year, 200 probably produced. And back then you had the three big staples. You had, you know, Stallone, you had Arnie, and you had Bruce Willis. And then there were others, you know, like Wesley Snipes and the rest of it, but those were the three B, three biggest ones because they commanded the box office. They got all the big parts, all the big films, best scripts. Planet Hollywood took off in like the early... 90s i want to say yeah maybe even slightly earlier yeah you know and so this is when they were at the peak so this is when he's he's still relatively new i'd say in 87 um yeah this is he'd had a run of things this is just before he kind of this was actually with the last film before he said i want to do comedy and then he yeah. did twins after this and then had his kind of comedy period and then kind of balanced the two mm. um but yeah he's he, again he says kind of they kind of reinvented the action world to kind of be bigger guys or guys who are muscle based so Stallone got beefier so yeah. even uh Clint Eastwood started to work out and started to wear like vest shirts in some parts off the back of stuff that was happening but it was very much larger than life kind of characters with those three really driving it and I think now it's a bit different like you've got the rock doing lots of stuff it's probably the closest to that type yeah. but it's still not quite the same diesel Vin Diesel yeah. the biggest one I'd say um who else is really big? I mean, I mean, he's he's come from a different place in some way, but you know, John Cena's now doing more action films and not just the WWE That's ones. True. He's gone from, oh, it's it's the Marine, the WWE John Cena film, and you go, yeah, okay, and then he but, stepped and moved into actual movies. Yeah, and you get people like you know, Stone Cold Steve Austin, who's been in things, but as his films have got smaller and smaller. Yeah, you've got. I still think Brian Bosworth should have been a massive. Uh, <laughs> The star, but I think yeah. it just came at the wrong time. It was just as they these names were kind of yeah shifting out of favor or taking on more serious roles or comedy roles, but non out and out action roles, I suppose. Um, maybe you can't make a career out of one good movie, but you know, um, but yeah, but it's just it was a totally different world in the 80s. Um, you know, with everything that's happened in the last two years, I don't know what the future of the cinema is, it will continue in some degree. And but I think big box office films and big action films are going to be things that you need to go and see at the cinema. But I think everything's changed. Right. Amblin uh, have made a deal, I think, today with Netflix to make six or seven more films. So Spielberg was the one who predicted, wasn't it, a couple of years ago that blockbusters will be in the cinema and you'll pay extra for them and maybe like you know the next Avengers film or whatever, mm. um, Jurassic World. But then 
and anything else you'll probably end up watching at home mm, it's interesting. which part of me gets as a cinephile goes oh no that's terrible then i also go well actually i I watched an awful lot of films at home as a teenager because I couldn't get to the cinema. So actually, I probably consumed more films at home then. Yep. yep. Um, it's quite a luxury to go to the cinema then as a kid. Uh, it, it, was. Bir- it had to be someone's birthday. <laughs> uh, who's the Ghostbusters? When's your friend's birthday? Uh, two weeks' time, then. You'll be seeing it then. What about Spies Like Us? Who else has got a birthday coming up? You can only see Dan Aykroyd films on people's birthdays. I've counted down the days now to the June film. That's the only thing that's going to get me probably to the cinema this year. I can't okay. see that the first time on TV. It would be an absolute crime to see that. The music, the visuals, everything looks so good. It's one of my favorite, you know, it is my favorite sci fi novel of all time. So to see it on the third adapt, this would be the third adaptation because mm. they didn't get the, um, they didn't finish doing the um, Jodorowsky one. It never got made, but the stuff behind the scenes is amazing. So this one looks like it could be fantastic. Uh, so that will get me at the cinema. But, um, yeah, this kind of big blockbuster action film, it'll, I think it'll still happen, but I don't know who the next big vehicle is yeah. beyond as The Rock and other things well, like that. I have been back to the cinema uh, post, sort of, say post-pandemic, during mm. the latter phases, we hope, of the pandemic. I quite liked it because... You get a row to yourself. <laughs> Not many people are going there. Yep. And it's really quiet. The only downside is I think they turned the air con off because they don't want to circulate the air. And yep. I went there on a day that was 28 degrees Celsius. Uh, so that was a bit of a challenge wearing a mask. I yeah. Think, I did feel like I was melting at times, but um, <laughs> nice to see the big screen. And it was very much not an action movie that I went to see, but... yeah. Anyway, we strayed a bit. We uh, have a bit. So, anything else you want to say about uh, Running Man? Look, check your notes. I, I'd forgotten that there was an opening crawl which that told you loads of stuff at the start. It was a big yes. exposition dump, which they didn't really need. No, really, because everything that it said, you did kind of find out for yourself. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a bit. I think there's a bit of a parallel between Ben Richards' character and Han Solo. Go on, because he's kind of on the edges and he's doing his own thing for himself. Yep. He's asked to join a rebellion and refuses. And then circumstances mean he ends up in part of that. And then over time, he kind of he ends up kind of buying okay. into their course. I'll, I'll allow it. Continue. Okay, thank you. I'd like to <laughs> thank you, Ron. Forward, uh, my hypothesis has been accepted. <laughs> the court um, will allow it, yeah. We've mentioned Sonali Sorsen as Killian's bodyguard. I, the bait and switch I like because... And I remember, oh, there's not a bit. I also remember, I very much vividly remember the pen going in the guy's back when he signs the contract. That yes. Was really stuck in my memory. <laughs> ah, just kind of, ah. <laughs> I love that. And he runs off. Ah. But he's, he's in the next scene, though. So he's obviously got a very quick bit of medical attention there. Um, <laughs> and yeah, there's, you, you know, the end, you're like, kind of, oh, it's going to be, oh my gosh, another, I, I remember forgetting, I was like, another fight? Him and Sven? And he's like, mm-hmm. And I think it was, you know, he said something about the. I think, does he make a steroids gag back? I, can't remember. I think it's, there's something to do with something that he said earlier that, he, you know, once something he'd said before to yeah. Killian. Killian is a great villain, I think. He's a perfect, like, over larger than life kind of capitalist figure that's just chucking money at every problem. It's just, and also this, now thinking about it, it didn't at the time, but there's echoes of Escape from New York. There are. There oh. are. There's also musically echoes of Escape to New York, so from New Carpenter York, Carpenter and because it's a Harold Faltermeyer did the score, right? As in, as in Beverly Hills Cop, Axel F. Uh huh. Um, but the the refrain is just very kind of like quiet, like kind of sad piano, kind of repeated motif is quite similar to Carpenter. Escape to New York. It's very yeah. Carpenter esque. Um, yeah, which I think is kind of the vibe they were going for. Carpenter's a genius. I mean, his, his films aside, and just the stuff stuff he's done with the music, it's just he's just so good at creating certain moods. Yeah. And he's got albums out that are like lost films and like they're amazing. They're yeah, just yeah, amazing. He's some. so good. Yeah, yeah. He's so good. But as well, like most people go, I don't like the music yourself. Please don't do that. That's just like don't be such a nasty. You, <laughs> you need to hire someone else. And you hear his music, yeah. it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's fine. It's, it, yeah, he can do it. Yeah. Off you go, off you go, John. But it is. I mean, <laughs> the music from this, Predator, Escape from New York, they're all in that kind of, they're just very, oh, I'm in that film. Some scores are just like, you might hear it and you go, it's a hands in one. Is it from this yeah, one or that one? I'm not 100% one. sure. I can't remember. But these are very much like, 
Yeah. No, this is the music from this film, which I think, if the music isn't very good, could go horribly wrong. But I this guess these these they do kind of work. Or oh, this does have a very cheesy kind of power ballad at the end, and there's no reason for them to kiss. There's no reason whatsoever. Like he's he's pretty much tied her up at one point. Yep. Offered to take her to Honolulu, which is you know that's quite nice. That's, that's nice. Um, you know, um, but like I. Just, puts his arm on her neck and he's like I could snap your head off if I wanted to and it's like mm -hmm. he's not you know and then he's quite a grey character a lot only, darker than you expect the only real kind of like well, there's never any chemistry between them really they just they she's oh they thought I was your uh, girlfriend and he goes oh really and at the end of the film it's almost like it's a film it's the 80s I'm a man you're a woman we should kiss it, ju it just it's oh go on then it, it came from <laughs> absolutely nowhere and it's almost like we've written this ballad now we've got it ready the band are about to play it you better kiss if you don't want to kiss it doesn't make any sense in the story well oh, yeah it's together, be together. We're together. <laughs> and like, you're gonna have to kiss the song is on someone with a mullet is somewhere behind the scenes singing this this isn't the side but i've just got start... a saxophone you must you must kiss i've got to mention this i just started watching the dead don't die the jim jim um uh, Jarmesh film. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's a tiny spoiler. There's like eight minutes into the film, they're in the car and they put the radio on and he goes, why is this tune so familiar? It sound familiar. What is it? And then he goes, yeah, but it's a theme tune. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> is it so, like that? Is it all really <laughs> So it's like, the ballad's playing, we have to kiss. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it's just so <laughs> But the, the, the film carries on, but they don't break the fourth wall. They don't kind of look at the camera and go, hmm. It just, it just carries on. Wow. Okay. It's, it's so good. It's so good. Anyway. Right. I think I've talked myself to death about this one. There's uh all right. Should we do some scores? Yeah. Go on. Then. Okay. So I'll be honest. If this, if this came out and, you know, Predator the same year, I'm always going to watch Predator. If those are the choice. You know, I can, I can watch one film before I die. It's going to be Predator. It's not going to be this. It's it's good. It's okay. There's some good moments in it. In Running Man, it's a bit cheesier than I remembered. Some of the one-liners kind of grated on me more than I remembered from when I saw it, you know, years ago now. Because it's really, it's fun back then. You quote the lines and you and you say the one-liners back, you know, to Arnie and you know them, this kind of stuff. And But after a while, I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. It made me want to go and read the original story to find out what it's about and say, okay, well, what are the differences? And, you know, it's like when we watch good TV, you think, I'll get more from the book. You watch The Expanse and go, I bet the books are brilliant, you get more stuff than you do because you want to find out more about it. Mm -hmm. So I wonder how dark the original character is, um, how over the top it is. There won't be any of the one-liners, but there has to be some of that kind of TV personality pizzazz thing. So I don't know. It's kind of to seeing what kind of archetypes is, uh, did they create and the characters and the, the celebrity hunters and all this kind of stuff. So it's it's it could be really kind of interesting to see when he wrote it to when it was made to nowadays on TV, how kind of prophetic was it? So that's kind of more interesting, I think, for me than, than the film itself. Um, it was all right. It was... I don't have a desperate need to go and watch it again. I don't know about you. Having watched it, I thought, eh, you okay? All right. Yeah. I, you know, it, I wasn't bored. There's good action scenes in it at times, you know, some of the good fights and things. Um, I'm going to give it a solid three out of five. Okay. I think that's fair. All right. I think, yeah. Okay. Go on. Well, so it's a lot tamer than I remember. As I say, yeah. I remember thinking it was quite gory, Dark. but it wasn't really. <laughs> um, I also remembered like Yafit Koto and uh, Michael McIntyre, the other mm. Michael McIntyre, that's a comedian uh, <laughs> of sorts. Uh, I forgot the name of the guy. Anyway, the other guy. Yes. Uh, I thought they were in it a lot, but they're not in it that much really. No. It, and you, and they're quite one dimensional characters. Again, teenage me was like, oh, this is cool. It's a TV show. And oh my God, it's a super violent TV show and Arnie's got his friends and now his friends are dead and the TV show's carrying on and there's a girl and they got a jumpsuit. Kiss the girl, kiss the girl. Yeah. <laughs> I would have been all into the, you know, the kissing the girl thing would have been great at the time. Um, but now with an older head, I'm kind of like, well, they almost pull it off, but there's so many kind of contrivances. There are little bits that you just go, oh, I'm not sure that quite worked it's a little bit undercooked story-wise 
there's just a little bit missing because you say, oh, it's near the end. Oh, okay. It feels you're missing like half an act um, somewhere in there. And I think um, if you compare it to something like Robocop, which is kind of exploring the same territory, yep. it's not as successful. I, would, I was expecting to give this like four or five because like, right. I used to watch this every weekend for ages. And maybe I'd just seen it too many times or is it probably just I'm older. But then if, if you compare it to like, I've seen Predator possibly more than any other film. Yep. And I also know all the lines from that. But I could I could go and watch that now. Yes. I don't particularly want to go and watch The Running Man again. I've just seen it. But if I'd seen Predator, like I watched this. Yeah, yeah. You could yesterday, watch Run again. I watched this yesterday. I don't want to watch it today. If yep. I watched Predator yesterday, I'd quite happily watch it again today. Yes. Because there's something very special about that film and the chemistry in it and everything, despite the fact that most of it was was recut in the edit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, the Predator didn't look anything like that until after they'd finished filming, which is still crazy. It's mad. You see all these articles, or oh, new Batman films having reshoots. It must be terrible. It's like, well, no, most of the films you've ever seen have had reshoots. They just didn't have, the, in- Damme, they didn't have the internet to tell you about. Exactly. It apparently was a nightmare and moaned all pink the time. Suit, a weird pink suit yes. and stuff. So. Yeah, and it was yeah. Like a lizard suit with a duck's head. Yep. Uh, pretty much. Um, so, yeah, I think it was <laughs> a bit undercooked. Um the change of director at the last minute from again from this Arnie book was like he said he, he felt some of the nuances of the what was what's the future of government, what's the future of entertainment, is things gonna be the cult of personality, which you know, yeah, Trump. Uh, you know, it's it was quite prophetic <laughs> in many ways. Yep. Reality TV and and, yep. and and politics and law enforcement. Oh, that'll never happen. One. What's the light, isn't it? Everything is showbiz, everything so that's politics now. Everything is showbiz, everything is entertainment. I think that works. So I think at the time I probably hadn't seen anything that had this kind of subversive conspiracy theory, anti-authority. So as a teenager, I was like, yeah, yeah, they're trying to make us do things, man. Show them. Uh, like the power, man. Yeah, come on. And which is very me. Like, this is the type of story that appeals to me a lot. Yeah. But there are other versions of this story, probably in the original book, possibly in the version that Andrew Davis would have directed. Mm. Uh, although he did make Chain Reaction, which isn't great. Uh, but, yeah, it's it's not as good as I thought it used to be. This is the yep. longest wrap-up in history. And I'm going to also give it three bags. Okay, I think that's five. fair. I think that's fair. Um, so We've covered a lot of Arnie films. Right. And, you know, this isn't one that I, I would think, yeah, like you said, I'll go back and watch it again. There's some that I'll quite happily re-watch. Like I know that Raw Deal's quite dark, and he's his character's not particularly nice, but it, that's something that, that you know I could rewatch, and especially Predator and even Commando for all yeah. of its cheese and all of its this Green Beret is going to kick your ass. I eat you for breakfast, and it's just like you know it's funny and it's good and it's quirky. And this I'm like, yeah, yeah okay, you know, maybe in a couple of years I'll watch it again, but I'm not I'm not rushing. Yeah. I think I'd rather watch True Lies again. Yeah. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't done that, have we? We've done True Lies. We, oh, we did. Done, we oh. haven't done. We say we, this is one of our only holes. We haven't done either of the Terminator films. Really? We haven't. No, wow. we've not done either of the Terminator films. Okay. So we say this is the only hole. There's a glaring, <laughs> glaring career-defining. Not, yeah, that, uh. yeah. There's quite a big hole. <laughs> okay, we'll we'll come back to Junior. We haven't done Junior. Yeah, I'm not doing. That. <laughs> we'll recircle Arnie at some Maybe point should, uh, you know, and do some more of his films in the future but anyway have you seen the running man recently have you seen it at all do you think they should remake it given that they're remaking so many things do you think they could actually do a better version like they remade total recall and that was a zero bag remake it was absolute (laughs) the new robocop film was absolute (laughs) so but you know could they do something better these days and make a more cutting edge version of running man with society and politics and cult of personality. I think the challenge you've got is it's too real now. Uh, well, how do you push it on to make it, oh, if it was set, it's a film it's set in 2017, how do you push it on to make it something that's set in 2090 or, or, or you know, 21, whatever, 57? How do you make something that's even further on from what we do now, you know, Black Mirror to the nth degree? It's an interesting challenge for someone. We'll see if they actually remake it. They're remaking so many other things. So have you seen The Running Man? If so, get in touch and let us know. What would, what score would you give it? You can email us. You can come onto the Facebook group. 
Uh, you can follow us on Twitter as well. If you want to come talk to us there about this film and all the other films. Uh, but that's it for this month. Uh, Pete? If you're watching us on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel and hit that bell. Notifications. <laughs> right, Pete, do you want to wrap us up? Uh, yes, thank you for listening, if indeed you still are, or watching. It's difficult now that we do video as well. It's very hard to wrap up yeah. the show. But uh, uh, or we could just say goodbye. 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 You have been listening to Bags of Action. No bullshit. We'd better stick around for the next episode, because if you're lying, I'll be back.